Hi there, good evening and thanks for joining me in this fresh edition of the program, The Insight on Equinox Television. Tonight we are at the parliamentary flat, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight my guest is an exceptional one this day. That is why the program is a special one. We will be talking about several issues that have been uh, ongoing, especially in the two English-speaking regions of the country, we shall equally be having as guest tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Wilbur Joseph. He is MP for Jakiri. It is found in Bui Division in the northwest region of Cameroon. Honorable, good day. Good day, sir. It's my pleasure to be with you. The pleasure is us. Thank you very much. Now, Honorable, you were present at the National Assembly uh, last Wednesday, your presence was dramatic. People were not expecting you to come out uh, on Wednesday after you missed out the match session. Now, what made you to come back? When you say come back, I get a little bit surprised because um, when you find yourself in danger, your human instincts tell you to go for cover. So, uh, when I suddenly realized that the constitution of the country had been so grossly violated and that orders had been given for my arrest, I even suspected the first target was to kill me. So I had to look for a safe place where I could take cover and uh, try to understand exactly what was going on and also try to think through clearly what was happening uh, to my country, try to think through what my people have suffered, the people of West Cameroon, what they have suffered from when we came into this union. So it needed me time to stay off a little bit, reflect, draw some conclusions and have some suggestions uh, as to what we should do to take our country forward. So uh, forget about the drama. When I made up my mind that it was time, I chose a day and the time. And I got back to the business the people voted me to come and do here. So where were you? In a safe bunker. It suffices to say that. When people are being chased for their lives and they come back, the important thing is not where they were. The second part is... Um, knowing the dangerous nature of our government because to tell you honestly uh, my friends were laughing at me the other day when i told them that uh, our government is gradually becoming a source of more danger to its citizens than any fatal disease or accident that's the truth because if a member of parliament protected only the, other, the only other person who is protected with him is the president and head of state. So if somebody can place an order, say arrest him because he spoke up for his people, definitely. We are living in a jungle. Okay, the arrest warrant brandished by SDF uh, members of parliament, uh, how did it come about? How, how did the SDF get hold of the arrest warrant? It is not for me to be giving you those details. The simple thing is we got the information in time enough. In fact, the president of the assembly actually confessed that I sent it to him because I wrote a letter to him and attached a copy and told him, this is why I am not in the assembly. And I am asking you to give me protection. And I waited and waited. He never replied. Afterwards, instead, he sent uh, me a query that I've been absent from the my session. And I repeated the same letter to him with the same information that this is why. So after reflecting and you know discovering that he would not be able to do it, I had to choose between standing up for my people and going to jail or being killed and running away. So realizing that our people have been permanently on the run from when we came into this union, I decided that I would not be one. In the name of the people of West Cameroon who voted me and sent me to this parliament, I decided I have to come up, continue my work, 
put myself as a wedge between this obsessed government, because the government is obsessed with violence. Yes, I decided I would come and continue my work, stand up to them, and put myself as a wedge between my people, the people of West Cameroon, and the government that wants to make sure that our voice is never heard, that we never live in dignity. Mm -hmm. So I made that choice. Honorable, before yeah. we move to what you have for the people of West Cameroon, you've always do I really have oh, anything? That's that, that, yep. that statement. Yes. The people of West Cameroon. Yes. Now, many people want to know how you escape. How was the escape like? There have been many versions on social media, how you parked your car in front of a building and disappeared. Um, I think it will suffice for me to say, and I will be coming back to the statement I just made. When you are dealing with a violent government like this one, you never discuss escaped because you make them wiser. So it is not for me to be mentioning anything. Mm -hmm. Suffice you, suffice for you to know that I found myself in danger, the chase was on, and I took care of uh, my safety. It suffices to say that. We shouldn't go to any details. How guaranteed is your safety now that you are back? Um, I've already answered that question. The issue for me now is not safety. I thought when the guns came out looking for me that the best thing was to be safe. And after, you know, a long while and reflecting and realizing that the people need me to speak up for them, to continue standing up for them, and it is for them that I do that. So I choose. I said, okay. Um, I told myself, uh, Wilbur, the time has come. Is your one life more valuable than the five million plus West Cameroonians you left back home, plus those in the diaspora who are looking up to somebody, to someone, to people to stand up on their behalf? And I said, if history has made it to fall to you, that you have to take this responsibility, then the issue is no longer how safe you are. But what else you can do for your people before the government takes you either to jail or to an early grave? And I reconcile myself with that and I get back. Hmm. Yeah. You know that uh, many persons are saying, uh, yeah. I always refer to social media because that is the pool. Yeah. Uh, many persons are saying that you, you are coming back my, in one way or the other disturb the presidency of the Social Democratic Front Party. Your correspondence you sent to the chairman, Nijon Fundi, reiterating your respect for him, yeah. and secondly, raising some worries about, uh, about your safety and the stance of the SDF party. Yeah. And the response of the SDF uh, chairman mm. here in the nation's capital, Yaoundé, yeah. uh, in one way or the other said, you, the activities you carried out was not in the name of the party. Um, you know, I'm glad. That's a good question. I'm glad with that. And uh, the one thing I want to tell you is that Weber, that you see, is a Democrat at heart. And while I will respect all authority, my party authorities, with what they think about what I am doing and say about what I am doing, I also want to hold my own democratic right to say it as I think and as I feel. So, um, to me, it is not an issue. I fought with the SDF from, no, before day one, because I was actually in the team that was preparing for the launching. And we launched and worked and, you know, supported the party in every way I could. Uh, my job as a civil servant went because of the party, because of how I stood up for it. So, and I believed that we should be able to push things to a certain level. And I have sat back. I have never been in any other party position, party office. And uh, after 23 years, 
I put in my candidacy and I find myself in parliament after winning the election. So if I come here and look for what I thought you could be able to bring forth that could bring profound change to your suffering people and I find no other way, I concluded as a revolutionary that I will go ahead and say it how I see it and say it how I think the people want it said. Even against party And I went ahead. Uh, already uh, for Hansen, one of the things I want to tell you is that uh, when you see a man who has made up his mind that he can die in jail because of his people, when you see a man who has made up his mind that his life can be shortened, his blood can be given for a cause for his people, you do not ask about discipline. Because in that case, it will not matter to me if the party chooses to do anything to me. Because I am talking in the name of the people who sent me here to represent them. And I think that there is a profound problem in West Cameroon with our dignity completely taken away. Everything as we know it as West Cameroonian taken away with the pretext of, in quote, national unity. And we lose our identity. And we are subjected to this kind of oppression as a result. It turns my stomach. In essence, the SDF has not been doing enough to stop this? What you are saying? Uh, I do not know what your assessment of that will be. Uh, it's my party. It is for you people to assess, not me. So I'm not putting any judgment on the party. I'm a fighter. That's why I stood up in the 90s when I was just turning 30 and fought as hard as I did for the party to stand. So it now surprises me that people actually very well placed in the party. Actually, I hear some are saying, you know, Weber has carried the West Cameroon thing on his head. And I challenge them with that. That is how I carried the party that is carrying them forward. So there must always be people like me who can challenge the status quo, who can bring in the necessary change, who can move things forward and I think that the suffering that our people have undergone in West Cameroon the silence that had been held as a result because silence perpetrates evil if we can't start speaking up to it and even facing the dangers to our lives nothing for our people will change so I have chosen to do that and I'm doing it. Okay. You are not afraid of, uh, of Article 8.2, 8 uh, according to what you are saying. Now, what is the relationship between you and Nijon Frundi, the national chairman of the party? Uh, when you say relationship, what do you mean? The relationship, like, uh, is it cordial? Cordial. That's what it means, cordial. Because as I told you, I'm a practical Democrat. And uh, what many people forget is that you don't actually need to like people before you, before you work with them in the same political setup. Where you need to like people or love them before you have them is your home. You need to love your wife and children to have them in your home. So in a political setup, people seem, you know, people learn to come together with common goals. And people may look at those goals from different angles. The targets for achievement, they may set different, you know, they may view it differently. So to me, uh, uh, working in the same political system and moving forward is not about liking people. Cordial relations are important to get certain things moving smoothly. So my relationship with the chairman is cordial. And uh, I'm talking about what I no, and what I give him, all his due respect, all his honor, and all the honor that he deserves. If we differ in opinion that I'm handling a certain thing in a way that he may not agree with, that is the dynamism of any political system that can, you know, take people forward. So uh, this very archaic and vague Cameroonian political notion 
that people must think the same, either like they are leaders or they must, you know, uh, it, it's not dynamic enough for somebody like me. So if I do not see certain on certain issues eye to eye with my party leaders, that's democracy. Now with the popularity that Honorable Wilbur Joseph yeah. uh, has today, uh, you have popularity not only West, in West Cameroon, not yeah. only in uh, former West Cameroon, yeah. uh, even in the other eight regions of the country, the convention of the SDF party will be coming. Do you see yourself with this popularity standing against Nijon Frunzi? Uh, in fact, the popularity part, I'm hearing it from you, I didn't know. Uh, I'm just going ahead with my work as is usual. I know that it has caused a stir, it's caused a lot of excitement. Popularity, no, you can only know that when you, you know, uh, uh, when you move to the people to hear them tell you that this has happened or that, you know, how does a man sit down and say that he is popular? So I'm hearing it from you and uh, it humbles me if I am because I keep asking myself what is it I have done that nobody, no other person could do because, you know, the things I say are the things we all live through. They are the things we experience. Um, the, in my presumption, anybody could have said it. Anybody can say it. Anybody can do it. And the, the little missing factor, which I seem to end up realizing, is that it needs a little bit of courage to say certain things and do them. And if I happen to have done, you know, uh, I'm just happy that our people think it is a good thing. Our people think it is a wonderful thing. And they think we should continue representing them in that way. So that to me, that's how I look at it. It's not in terms of popularity. And talking about uh, the convention, yeah, the convention and elections coming. The one area where even people who love me, like my family, like my friends, like my political associates and all the other people, the one thing that surprises them about me is my disinterest in power. I am not interested for one second. I am not. You mean you have, you have, you have pressure from the headaches, other MPs, the, the headaches on those jobs is huge. I cannot want to punish myself that way. I cannot want to. So it's not something that, even in a dream, I think about. I see how much the chairman suffers. It does not interest me. So uh, the convention will come and go. There are people who feel a certain ambition to be a certain thing, to be a certain that. My biggest ambition is just to continue bringing change. I call myself a mover and a shaker. That's what I am. So people conjecturing into, oh, he now wants the chairman's place, he now wants this, he now wants that. They are free to think as they want. Wilbur is a down-to-earth fighter who will fight for rights, fight for change, fight for anything that can be good for his people. Maybe it is fighting to take a position. Count me out. A position in the, in the SDF party. What about you having this uh, projection? that yeah. tomorrow we might become the president of this West Cameroon you have been talking about? Um, you have a misconception between the terminologies and the appellations we use. I have talked to West Cameroon. Many people get very critical and sometimes very angry about it. Or you should, you should call it this, you should call it that. And I tell them, what's in the name? When we came into this union, our appellation was West Cameroon, and the appellation for those on the other side of the Mongo was East Cameroon. I stay with that because I'm still stressing that the voice of reason should now take over emotion for the government to stop the harassment of our people so that the issues that have to do with West Cameroonians should be addressed so that we can build a country that is stronger. And the base for that address, to me, 
its objective is revisiting the foundation on which what we call Cameroon was built. 1961, which was the, yeah, which was the two state federation. We go back to that foundation and begin discussions from there where the people of West Cameroon and the people of East Cameroon will drive those discussions to will no longer be Weber's issue. It will now be an issue for the people to determine that we have experienced this in 55 years. We think it should now be different. And the difference should now be this or this. It is for the people. The issue is not me. Okay. Yeah. But are you for cessation or return to federalism? Because, like you said, many people are, well, are well, like confused when you talk of West Cameroon. Uh, they don't know your stand. Are you for cessation or for federalism? Like the, the what the SDF stands for? That's federalism. And, and I, 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 I don't believe in stands. This is that where is your stand? Where is your stand? My stand is on our people, the people of West Cameroon, living in dignity and in freedom. And whatever definition that freedom will take them to, they will be the people to define. So, I have repeated to you, any sane discussions on the way forward in Cameroon, we have to go to the foundation that brought us together. I repeated it to the President of the Assembly the other day. What brought us to this union was a two-state federation. If we want to start discussing how the country can be better, we have to get back to the foundation. Because already, you have already seen, the foundation is cracked, is broken. So, any person, the foundation is cracked, then the walls are now breaking, and the roof is curving in. Anybody who begins to believe that we should just, you know, let's plaster it, let's repaint it, let's put on a new roof. If the foundation is not proper, nothing works. We have to go to the discussion table, beginning with two people came together as brothers. What happened between the lines that one is becoming a master and the other a servant and a slave is not what will interest us. The issue will be, let's get back here. When we get back on this table and we start the issues, your culture had this, ours had that. Your way of life was this, ours had the other thing. That is where we begin. And I have told you, you know, uh, I don't like these issues in Cameroon where people sit and project. We should now do this so that the result will be this. How do you know what a result will be when you have not begun even just anything? So we need to get back to the roots of our history. That's why I took a lot of that time out there to reflect, to review our history again. And I found out the reason we are where we are is because the union was done in bad faith. And from the very beginning, the government of Ahijo started the undermining of what was ours. Undermining our political system by ending the multi-party system. 1966? Okay. Good. Undermining our educational system by creating one university and bringing us down here and force feeding us with lessons in French. That's why we will end up half on half. What Ahijo should have done would have been to respect these people's culture. They should have a university of their own. We should have ours. If anybody chooses to go to any, it will be their choice. Mm -hmm. It cannot be perforce. So he undermined everything. Then the judicial, our judicial system and practice, he watered down everything. And the Bia regime came and took over and continued in the same vein. All right. That is why in the final analysis, we end up with a system that ends up producing people who have no values. When we, as West Cameroonians, we as English-speaking Cameroonians, we have our set of values that should be there things we can work on and know where the results will take us to. Those are the things we are asking. Anybody who believes that being united means turning the English-speaking people into French-speaking people, 
In fact, the term I use for it is their objective from the beginning was to Frenchify us. I put that in quote. Yes, to Frenchify us, to make us be like them. The biggest error the governments of this country have made has been this particular one thing. They want us to be like them. And that is not unity. It is slavery. And that's what I'm decrying, that it must end. Okay? We must bring it to an end. Our people must end it. You cannot have a dual system. The Canadians have proven it. It works. The Belgians have. It works. You cannot grow up in Quebec and then you are told that there is only one university you can go to, which is in Ottawa. And you go there and they are lecturing you in a language you do not master, a language you do not understand. It is a form of enslavement. And that is what I am decrying. And that is what I am saying. If we hope to move this country forward, we get back to those values. They have undermined it to the level now where the freedoms we used to enjoy as West uh, Cameroonians have been taken away. And all of a sudden, doing a demonstration to express yourself, which is a democratic right, has now become the surest source of death for West Cameroonians than even AIDS, cancer, and accidents put together. It's the surest way to die. That's the way you know that you are not in a country that is yours. You are not living in freedom. You are condemning government, uh, government's response to the, the worries of uh, Anglophone uh, Cameroonians who came out, uh, the lawyers that began in, in the month of October, yeah. then followed by the teachers on the 21st of November, then followed by the civil society, the teachers on the 21st of November, then followed by the civil society. It is not condemning. I decry it. It is abuse. The question I've asked consistently is, why is Balankongo, Fontem, Honorable Aya Paul, BBC, and the rest of those people, why are they in jail? Why are they there? There's no reason. They are there because they are different. They are there because they are from West Cameroon. And where are they in jail? They are in East Cameroon. Which takes us back to the colonial mentality that the government still maintains. One, even if you do something that is against the law, according to them, so that law does not extend to Boya and to Bamenda. That's what they have said. By bringing them to Yaoundé. That's what they have said. So they are the people dividing this country and then crying that those who are trying to build it by saying we should fix up these things, they are ruining the country. They are the ones dividing Cameroon. They are the ones. If you or me cannot stand trial where you were born, then they are taking you to somewhere where they are sure that they can do with you as they will. It is not the law again. It is no longer the law. So I decry it completely. Why are they there? And I am asking them, every day I have the opportunity to say, any form of normalcy that we need to bring to Cameroon and start moving things forward, release them without precondition. Give an overall general amnesty so that the people we have chased into exile should come back and be building their country. They have done nothing. The only thing is that they have refused you are gradual machinations to turn them into the mentality you believe, the mentality of succumbing to everything that is authority, even if they are taking off your head. You say nothing. They are there because they speak English. They are there because they are from West Cambo. They are there because they are different, because our culture is different from theirs. These are the things we know in our culture that you do to stop government excesses. You demonstrate. You say, no, this is not correct. And a good government, a government that is living for the people, a government that exists for those people, they, that government would listen to those people. Mm -hmm. But since our government exists for itself, the only way to protect itself, 
shoot down anybody who says the government is not doing right. Take them to jail. The rest will run. It will not work. But the government uh, has listened to, to, the, to what Anglophones have been crying for. If you look at the uh, educational system, you don't see get that me, they, don't there have been some redeployment. Don't get me angry, Hans. There have been some redeployment. Don't get me angry. So you have sunk to the level, like the rest of them, where you now think that what belongs to you as a right is taken away and privileges are given and you are dancing at the privileges. The privileges can be taken back anytime. It is about our rights. It is about our existence as a people. You do not take what belongs to us, take away our freedoms, and then you are saying, oh, the educational system, uh, they have now agreed that they will add this, they would add that. They are adding it to what? What belongs to us was cultural. We take everything back and run it how it benefits our people best. So what they are doing is just window dressing? I don't even think it reaches the level of window dressing. It does not. It's just a pretense. It's a farce. Nobody who is serious should be listening to things like that. Hans, I hope we are living in the same country. Exactly. We have more than a million children who haven't been in school. And we are not running to set a forum quickly so that children can go to school. They are acting that drama all over West Cameroon, you know. The deals are running here left and right. I've seen in some places, gendarmerie guard mounted outside classrooms that they are writing the GCE. What fast? Is Cameroon in a state of war? What nonsense. Whom are they abusing? It's annoying. So all of those cosmetic things they are doing, um, if I have my wrinkles on my face, because maybe I am 80 or 90 years old, and go to a makeup salon, and they fill them up, and I come out and say, I am 20 years old. It's only a, an idiot. Who will believe? It's cosmetics. They are performing. We need profound surgery to resolve issues for our country. That is not the way to go. The dialogue table is the only way. That way will show respect for our people. I've told you about the children who have not been to school. Mm -hmm. We have Bala, Fontaine, and the rest in jail. Shopkeepers have shut down their shops for seven months. They go hungry themselves. And somebody thinks that they are just joking. Somebody thinks that they are just doing it for pleasure. Somebody thinks that you will bring a cosmetic tool, some perfume, and just spray it. And the guy start dancing, say, no, it smells well. So we are all right. The government has now said this. And I've been repeating to our people, governments don't give rights. People take them. Yes, government don't give rights. Go government will give you what limits you in every way from challenging that government. So it's cosmetics. I don't even want us to be talking about it. You are wasting our time. Because the place to go is the people are talking. Five million plus people in West Cameroon, they are now almost reaching a point of rebellion. They are rejecting everything the government has put down because they have been hurt and humiliated and treated with all forms of indignities for over 55 years. And when they talk, you don't listen. You want people to sit down and begin to say, oh, you know, uh, they just signed the other decree the other day. They just gave this. They just gave that. Those are people who don't love this country who begin to dance at things like that. They don't love this country. If they love it, they'll be asking for a debate table. This is not what we thought was. If our people have gone out on this outcry, something is definitely wrong. Somebody needs to sit there and ask the question, why is this government afraid of debate? 
why is the issue of going to a discussion table so anathema to the government? My answer is simple. They don't believe we West Cameroonians are the same with them. It is the attitude of the master who says, sit down with the servant and discuss what on the table. That's the attitude. That was seen during the French rule, the direct rule. Exactly. So that's why I'm saying, I was telling the Minister of Territorial Ministry on the Assembly the other day, I said, I told you in December, you are governors, you are DOs, you are subdivisional officers, the commanding officers, their whole attitude in West Cameroon is that of people running a colony. That's why you hear a deal is coming and people are running. They are scared. They see a red card from a gendarme. They are running. They are frightened. They see a black card from a police officer. What country are we running? The forces are law and order are the forces that in civilized countries, and I'm sorry to say we are not civilized. In civilized countries, you were in danger and you saw an officer and you said, thank God, there's an officer nearby. Here we run because our system has been run in such a way that gradually the forces of law and order has been turned into the forces of the protection of those in power rather than the protection of the people who pay the taxes for Bueto's people to get their salaries. They have been turned against the people. So actually we have an anti-people force. Yes. Look at the blood on their hands in West Cameroon. Look at how many people they have killed. And when you are talking, as I was asking the Minister of the Territorial Administration, they will tell you that the law says this. And I challenge it telling them, Mr. Minister, laws in civilized nations are made to protect citizens. Once a law becomes a sure source of death for any citizen, you repeal it the same day. You repeal it the same day. What's the law there for? Which means if a thousand of us die, they point at the law. If you stand up and you point at one of them and you challenge them, they send the very people to come and shoot you down because they think so they have become more important than the country that they claim they are ruling. There are people who are above the law, who are above the constitution, without which how would I be running for cover as an MP? They are above the constitution. So they now run the country like a gang organizes itself. Because in gang law, survival is the only thing. It doesn't matter who you kill. It doesn't matter what you destroy. You have to survive. And that is what I'm decrying and saying. It must end. You don't run a country like that. Not a civilized nation. This is the 21st century. It has to be different. So, Honorable, the blame goes to the head of state, Paul Bia. To, to tell you honestly, to tell you honestly, he is part of the system now. He runs it now. He runs it. He has to be blamed for it. That is the issue with leadership and statehood. You take the responsibility. Remember, I, like the rest of the 100 and 79 members of the National Assembly, which is 180, are the only other people with the president who have immunity. So, if all of a sudden, because you have spoken the truth that people in power don't want to hear, they put the constitution aside and are chasing you with guns, you are telling me that, you know, you, what you are telling us, what you are telling us is that your country has no rules. Because that's the first thing to recognize. Once the law 
is above everybody. They would not even think of it. Because if this were a civilized country, anybody who took part in that decision would be leaving office immediately. That's the first thing. Before they set up an, a commission to investigate, and if they found you guilty for breaking the law of the land, which is the constitution, you are behind bars. But you now have free people behind bars, and the people who are breaking the constitution to bits and pieces are sitting up there and giving orders. We cannot continue with this. We West Cameroonians do not know this. And that's why we are decrying. And if they do not know that Cameroon will be a better place, doing or learning from us the things we know that are better, then the problem is theirs. Instead, they want to kill all of us that and kill us and add to it before it satisfies them. No. That's not how you run a country. That's not how you run a country. It is not done. It is not done. The country belongs to its people, not to its government. Take this from me. Every country belongs to its people, not to its government. The reactions and the actions of the Cameroonian government prove one thing. We are supposed to be their property, and they do with us as they will. Without any reference to the Constitution. Without any reference to the Constitution. So, it is about political survival. It is about the people who hold power. And these are the things we think should not continue. Uh, I was telling my colleagues from, you know, French Cameroon, I was telling them, if to you this is normal, to us it isn't, because we belong to a different culture. And don't try to make me be like you, because I will never be. I will never be. If you cannot stand up to your government and stop its excesses, the government crushes your people. That's what every government does. That's why the issue of building strong institutions in every country is primordial. But is it possible in Cameroon to build a strong institution when we know that the executive has uh, a commanding hand uh, over the judiciary, legislators? It is not me you ask. It is the people of Cameroon. Ask them that question. Everything is possible in civilized society. That is why we, from West Cameroon, are struggling to say no. We are denying that way of rulership. We are denying that way of mistreating citizens and bringing in every single excuse to kill your citizens and jail them to protect those in power. It is not done. I've been saying it over and over. Good countries, civilized countries, when they have governments, those governments fear the people. In Cameroon, it is the reverse. The people, 21 plus million of us, are shivering before the government. That is where you know that you have a bad government. Mm -hmm. When people live in fear of their government. Governments live in fear of their people in civilized society because they will remove you the next day. If you don't get up to scratch, you are out. But here is the reverse. We live in fear. Those of us who are standing up to talk for the people we represent and taking all the risks we are taking, it is to get to a level where we can build governments that fear their people. Can that be possible in Cameroon? Very possible. Very possible. It's doable. It is doable. That's why we are saying, let's get to the discussion table. We'll tell you how. And if the how for us who speak English is too difficult for you to manage, okay, then what are you telling us? I was asking the, the speaker in the assembly, I said, if we are elected to come here and talk on behalf of people, and you are knocking your hammer that you cannot mention that here, uh, this is not what we have on that discussion, you are telling us that the remnants of whatever you have left of democracy are gone. When the elected member of parliament cannot talk for their people, democracy is dead. We are then in a total dictatorship 
where a group of people gang themselves up against the people and say they will either take what we we'll give them or we we'll kill them. That's what our government is telling us. Okay. Either we take what they give or we are gone. Mm -hmm. And that's why the likes of me and the people of West Cameroon are saying we can do it better and we will stand up and say no. This is not how it is done. Okay. Before we go, your next plan of action. Um, this is what is wrong with Cameroon. People are always talking about plans of action. And I'm supposed to be planning mine in the market with you on the media. I'm sorry. I have nothing to tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to tell you about that. You don't do that. Okay. Okay. You see, but most of the time, you know, people begin to talk about, you know, plans of action and all of this, you know. Uh, most of the time, it ends up because you don't have really nothing. Yeah, so yeah. Somebody might be asking, how do you intend to pull all this together when other MPs are not thinking the same way you are thinking? <laughs> how possible can uh, that be? That, 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 that makes me laugh. You know the reason? I learned something from my grandfather when I was still very young. He taught me something. Never think you are too small. Never reduce your value. Because one person is enough. He told me that. One person is enough. And then you will see from everything that has happened in the world, it's always been about a certain person deciding that he thinks Instead of going down, we should now go up. So, uh, the issue is not the one person. The issue is the people on whose behalf this one person has been talking repeatedly, being chased, being threatened, being told all sorts of things. What do those people do? That's what's important. It's about the people. It's not about me. In fact, I can actually tell you that for 55 years of being subjected to this silence, for being brought into this culture of fear, just breaking the silence, like you people have confirmed, I have done. My job is done. Okay. My job is done. It is yours and the people now that is left. The silence has been broken. This is not how you rule people. This is not how you treat people. You treat people with more respect and dignity. And when you tamper with a people's dignity, that is when even the weakest of the weak will raise a finger and scratch out your eye. All right. Thank you very much, Honorable. Thank it was you. a pleasure uh, receiving you in this edition of, of, of the program. We know it's not been easy. The pleasure was actually mine, and uh, I hope that uh, by going through all of this, we are spending good time and making the case for our people's dignity more recognizable and more acceptable so that even the government that is turning a blind ear to everything and acting drama, our call now is simple. It is time for reason to take over emotions. People should sit down and talk about the future of their country. The government has no right, no right, and I repeat, no right to take a telling attitude on Cameroonians. They are telling us do this. They are telling us do that. They have no right. The other day I said in the assembly, loud and clear. Our people have rights now. Whom does the country belong to? So don't treat our country like your personal property because you are governing it. God forbid.
Okay. It was a pleasure having you. It was equally a pleasure being with you uh, in the company of uh, Honorable Wiba Joseph of the Jakiri constituency. It is a special constituency, the special to constituency be more <laughs> yeah. located in uh, Bui Division in the northwest region of uh, Cameroon. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining me in this special edition of the program, The Insight on Equinox Television. We are at the Parliamentary Hotel here in the nation's, uh, the Parliamentary Flat here in the nation's capital, Yaoundé. And uh, the uh, team of The Insight has been received uh, deep inside the Parliamentary Flat by the Member of Parliament for Bafu Tuba Constituency, Mesam North. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Honorable Fosina Mukong. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? No, we are doing great. We are great that I'm happy and particularly delighted that you take time off to meet some of us so that we can share our views on our activities within Parliament. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you came once again in the limelight after your first passage that was in the northwest region of Cameroon at the Congress Hall when PM Young came out. We saw you were very outspoken. Now you were refused giving the floor at the National Assembly Wednesday. What exactly happened? Uh, you know, after a bill is tabled before Parliament, the minister will come in to defend the bill. And it is within that period that the parliamentarians have to question the minister on the bill and other burning issues within his ministry. It was on that light that I took, wanted to take the floor to question the minister, minister of territorial administration on some burning issues within our country mm -hmm. and those concerning the bill. Unfortunately, I was dressed in our Northwest traditional dress, our traditional regalia, that the, P, uh, the speaker termed it a tricot. And I think the whole world knew it was not a tricot because I think I'm conversant that coming out before the nation, I should be properly dressed. And the dress that I was putting on was part of what was carried by the junior team when it was going out for the international com uh, competitions in the World Cup. I was dressed like that and uh, the speaker in order to block my intervention since he knew that Are you sure are, that was the main reason? That's what I believe because they know those who are outspoken those who are able to handle issues, burning issues within the ranks of parliament. Mm -hmm. Some of us are those who are vocal and we come out and we talk plain on everything that is happening concerning our nation. Mm -hmm. But is it part of the dress code? Is it part of the standing orders? Uh, the, the standing orders assembly? allows a parliamentarian to be formal. And being formal, you can be in your traditional regalia and you can be in the Western culture that is being formal. Mm -hmm. There is no explanations more than being formal. Okay. So that a parliamentarian should be formal. I knew I was formal, and that is why even my group leader went up to let him know that I was formal. I'm in a traditional regalia, I'm formal, but he did not give in. Mm -hmm. You definitely had many things you wanted to discuss on when you demanded to be, be allowed to... Uh... Yes. The bill in question was the bill on the Economic and Social Council. Where for over 30 years, a group of people, six in number, have been embezzling over two billion on a yearly basis. To me, I call it embezzling because the Economic and Social Council have not been in existence. It is a name. We have not had, seen them having meetings like any other formal uh, committees that come out with meetings. But they have been awarded a budget of $2 billion on a yearly basis. I wanted to verify from the minister the impact of the Economic and Social Council to this nation at this particular moment. And what have they been doing for the past 30 years? I wanted to find out what has been happening that out of the 150 members, only six 
are in existence. And this money is earmarked and they are mismanaging it on a yearly basis. I wanted to find out, let him clarify the Cameroonian nation why this sort of, uh, why now that this kind of abuse should come after 30 years of silence. I wanted to know from the minister other burning issues which involve one time you know the Boko Haram issue came up and seen as Minister of Territorial Administration the, he was the chairperson to man the activities of uh, the committee that was selected to manage the money contributed by the entire nation mm -hmm. for Boko Haram people were contributing against Boko Haram, against Bo Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. Because you know that during that time too, governors were receiving money, Jews were receiving money. I questioned, I was the one who questioned in parliament, that which account is this money going? They hurriedly create an account. They hurriedly create a committee. And since then, there have been no feedback. I wanted to know the accounts. How far have the management, uh, how far has it carried out the management of these funds? At, at what level? Who is the person he is answerable to? How can we, know, can we know the detailed statement of account of these funds that came in from the entire nation and how it is, they are being managed mm -hmm. to date? I also wanted to find out concerning the Anglophone problem. The Northwest and Southwest region for about eight months have been in crisis. Our schools, our children have not been going to school. There have been ghost towns. The lawyers are not working. Our courts are closed down. And the presidency acknowledged these problems, spoke of dialogue. The Senate spoke of dialogue. Our speaker in the House spoke of dialogue. I wanted to know who is going to start the dialogue, who is orchestrating this dialogue. Because this dialogue that you are talking about and people are not going to school. Children are forced to sit for final year exams when they have not gone for a formal education. What are we doing with them? We are destroying the values of education to the Anglophone system. I wanted to find out from the minister, when is this dialogue going to take place? When is it going to take place? Can there be another dialogue again? Because the... Because uh, the, I don't. The, the chief of cabinet at the prime minister's office, Paul uh, Gugumu Mingo, had said uh, some time ago that uh, the case has been closed uh, when he gave his uh, uh, I the think results if... of the dialogue that took place, the final one that took place on the 13th of January in Bamenda. Uh, do you think that there I can think, be another dialogue? Again? I think to me it was not dialogue. Because if it was that, then in this last, our last session, our, our, uh, our speaker will not talk about dialogue again. The dialogue at the time were for the stakeholders of education and the stakeholders of uh, the bar. So which type of dialogue are you talking about today? I mean, a, 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 a dialogue that will involve the civil, civil society, will involve the elites, will involve those who matter in the Northwest and Southwest, so that we can come out and tell the government where the pain is, because we are those feeling the pain. We don't expect that we will continuously stay quiet and another school year will start and our children will be left out. We thought that we should chart a way forward by coming out with a dialogue which involves the state, civil society, political leaders and political parties and those who matter, even the religious bodies. So some sort of national dialogue like what is going on in Gabon? A kind of dialogue of that magnitude so that can be able to justify our being together so that we can see whether this progress has yielded dividend where did we falter so that we can come out get solutions so that we can build together those were the questions i wanted to find out from the minister of territorial administration who manages the entire territory and he is aware of what is happening because i know our governor, our SDOs, and the rest of the administration are giving him information on what is happening in the Northwest and Southwest province. It was on that light that I had to come up, take the floor in Parliament, 
and the governor um, uh, and my speaker turns my appeal, mm -hmm. turn down my appeal. Mm -hmm. Honorable Fosu in Namukong, uh, dialogue you're talking about, can dialogue be genuine if those arrested are not released? These people who began the dialogue, who were the first persons to, uh, I'm talking about uh, Barista Balanko. It cannot be genuine. That is why if the dialogue was open, those of us who are outside will be able to tell government to release these people. Somebody who informed you about your ills and you acknowledge them and you keep them in jail. It is not positive. We cannot continue to live like that. We expect that if they even open up the dialogue, those of us outside will tell government, please, can you give these people amnesty? Because you know something that is happening with those who are arrested, most of those who are arrested are not even those who committed the crimes. Because do, when crimes are committed, those who commit, most of those who commit the crimes they, 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 uh, are those who, who do it carefully and they go away. And when the forces are coming, those who stand to watch what happened are those who are arrested. So the innocent, are, most of those in over 70 in detention are the innocent people. I wanted to find out from the minister how far are we going with this? Mm -hmm. Can we continuously stay in this kind of atmosphere in which we don't know? Because our electorates are expecting us, the parliamentarians, to say something, to come out with something so that we can have a way forward for this nation. Okay, Honorable. Now, uh, there are over eight bills that have been tabled so far at the uh, National Assembly. One of them is the restructuring of, uh, of the Supreme Court. Do you really think that the government is uh, doing a great job to see that problems raised by teachers and lawyers are resolved? One of them, the creation of a, a common law bench at the Supreme Court. I think it is overdue. They have been overdue because of 54 years. Most of the cases that are brought from appeal court from the Norway and Southwest province, when they arrive at the Supreme Court, they will take over 10 years because there's no bench, there's no English bench. That one, I think I appreciate government for tabling that bill, and I, I think that it's a way forward for us to resolve some of the issues. I say some because the issues are, there are so many issues that the Anglophones are feeling that they have been marginalized. We, we, what, what are the issues? You know, of recent, the magistrates, we don't uh, the Enam issue, where we don't have English magistrates. They were trying to recruit some magistrates now to go to Enam. That only Francophones are being sent to our, uh, our uh, areas. Before, you know, this issue of the teachers, the shortage of teachers, science teachers, in which Francophone teachers are sent to teach our children. The, there are so many other issues, the marginalization. Imagine the Minister of Education with five ministries with no Anglophone. Who is going to explain our deal to the nation when there is no minister representing us in education? For many years, there have been no minister. When you are an Anglophone, you know that you can never be Minister of Territorial Administration. You know that you can never be Minister of Finance. You know that you can never be Minister of Justice. You can't know that you cannot be Minister of Foreign Affairs, and you can name them. The people who have, throughout these 54, 56 years, been marginalized in such a way that only a national dialogue can give us assurance that this unity that we had, that this marriage that we took, can continue to yield dividends. It is on a forum of that magnitude that we can talk to each other. We can share to build a common nation. Without that, the people are still very suspicious. That is why you see parents comfortably keeping their children at home. You see courts not going. Lawyers are at home for over eight months. That shows the disgruntled nature of the people. The ghost towns are alive, showing that they are not yet satisfied. Mm -hmm. So w what can be done so that they, they should be satisfied? Because I if you ask the government, they will tell you they have done just so many things. They have redeployed uh, some of the teachers in secondary schools with uh, Minister Ngale Bibehe Masena. Uh, we've seen like what you said, some of the magistrates have been uh, they are recruited as far as enemy is concerned. And even so many others, what can really be done today for things you to know, come back to normalcy in English Cameroon? You know that redeploying people 
setting up a committee of bilingualism and multiculturalism and not constitutionalizing it. We need these things need to go into to be enshrined in our constitution. So that any government coming up anytime will know that when once it comes to governors, it is this, it is this. But when once it is a mischief kind of creations without it being constitutionalized. We expected bills from government to come in to constitutionalize these things so they should go into our constitution and anybody coming up to manage any ministry will know that when once there is an anglophone, the next man should be a francophone. And when once there is a francophone, the next man should be an anglophone. In that sense, it will show that we have a sense of belonging. We are part of it. Mm. But you know that if you come to the presidency, it's a francophone. The senate president is a francophone. The president of our assembly is a francophone. The senior vice president of, 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 of senate is a francophone. The senior vice president of uh, assembly is a francophone. The anglophones are seen to be nowhere. The prime minister is the, an anglophone. The prime minister should be the fifth arm of government. So we are classified like the fifth. That is where we have to come out with our grievances and tell the government where the shoe is pinching. Coming out with commissions without sitting and having dialogue with the people. I think the president have called about dialogue. They need to organize the dialogue. They did not call or, or the president did not talk about setting up committees. He said dialogue. And dialogue means going to meet the people and you people come out with a common forum. Come out with the common ideas that justify where we are going. That is the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the pertinent questions I wanted to ask the Minister of Territorial Administration. Who should be the right person to call on these two regions to sit together and we talk and come out at a common forum so that we can chat the way forward. Mm -hmm. That is the way I look at it. And that can, from there, we constitutionalize it. We put in it in the constitution so that from now henceforth, the marginalization should not more continuously take place. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are others who say in order to end marginalization of uh, Anglophones in Cameroon, uh, there are two uh, schools of thought. One, cessation. The other, federalism. Which one do you support? Me, um, I came here through a political party. My political party stands for federalism. And I am standing as the mouthpiece of a political party. I will talk federalism because I know that when, when once we have federalism, the governors will be elected. Our budgets will be evenly distributed to all the regions. And every region will be able to manage its roads, manage its health structure, manage its education, and develop itself. My party is a national party, the SDF, that stands for federalism, and I am a subset of the party. So my party cannot be talking federalism, and I talk about sex, uh, cessation. cessation. Mm -hmm. So you are for federalism? I'm for federalism, mm -hmm. as my party stands. Yes. That is why I said it is necessary that we come out and we sit on a common forum and we talk together and we come out with other with, with, with modalities that can set things moving. Mm -hmm. You know, as we were talking about other bills, there was a bill on finance. We are about 17 months to the beginning of the hosting of AFCO by Cameroon. Can stadiums be constructed within 17 months? Because the government came in with a bill that they want to construct stadiums. Because you know what happened? In Ebolowa, they said they were, when the agriculture was about going to Ebolowa, they spoke about a hotel, a hundred rooms. Until date, thing where the agriculture took place, that building have never been completed. But the agriculture took place. So I, we thought that the, the, the government should only not be coming out asking parliament to be giving authorization for money to be borrowed and putting the burden on the future generation. We should talk, talk on realistic things that we are able to carry out because in reality, Cameroon cannot be able to construct a 60 
60,000 capacity seating stadium within 17 months. To me, I don't see it coming. So Cameroon might not host the Nations Cup? I don't know. Maybe they'll use the old stadiums. I cannot say, but in reality, we are just giving a blank check to the state mm -hmm. to borrow and do what they like. Now, you talk about 17 months, that's the AFCON 2019, but there are big events that are coming up in 2018. We have four major elections. Uh, in, in that period, it has not been discussed. Many are raising eyebrows. Will the elections be, be we postponed? Or? We don't know. We thought that something on electoral court should come up again. You know, most of us have tried to come out with private, uh, private member bills that are turned down. Mm -hmm. We thought the government should be sensitive enough to come out with some, of, some feelings of the people so that we can have pure, transparent elections where the biometric system is for registration and the biometric system is for declaring uh, declaration of results and give full independence to the electoral committee. That is what is happening in the rest of democratic systems in the whole world. Cameroon should not be an exception that when once you have an electoral committee, they are not able to be independent to manage their activities to the end. Mm -hmm. So I thought a bill of that nature would be of will, will be, will be welcoming. Now, how did MPs welcome the, the, the bill on, on defense? That's uh, making sure that uh, tomorrow we won't be seeing, seeing military men going on strike. Uh, well, you know, most of the bills are coming out. We, we know the military people are also personnel. They are people who reason. They have a right to demonstrate. They have a right to tell you that it is pinching here. When once bills of this nature comes, like the bill that came on terrorism, in which people are being transferred now to ba ba from Bamela to Yaoundé, in which we all co completely condemned. The SDF condemned and we, we staged a work out. We refused to vote the bill. We staged a work out and proved that that bill cannot go, that when people talk anyway, when people manifest, clamoring for something, they are arrested that they are terrorists. It is not founded. Imagine that we are happy that children will go out to manifest, asking for good governance asking for federation, and they are detained and transferred to Yaoundé. It is not normal that people, will, the lawyers will come out clamoring for a good judicial system, and they are carried to Yaoundé, they are detained, arrested, some are on the run. It is not formal. We should, we should be, we, are, we as the parliamentarian should be able to be sincere and tell the nation the truth, where the shoe is pinching. Okay. Before we go, Honorable, any last word to uh, those who are watching, especially on the Anglophone crisis, what I want that, to, that, that panacea today? I want to say that I am particularly sympathetic with the situation of our brothers, the Anglophones. It is like a deep pain piercing my heart because I see the people now in a position where they don't see where they are going. Imagine that when people keep their children out of school, you show how painful, how the pain is piercing. We have been touched and we think that when the state is talking about dialogue, that real dialogue be organized with stakeholders, politicians, civil society leaders, traditional leaders, and the entire population, let's come out, political parties, and let's talk about this issue, and come out with everlasting ideas that may change our constitution, and build a nation of national unity that will be based on federalism. And we believe that with that, we can be able to carry the way forward for this nation. All right. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure. Uh, having you in this edition of the program. Thank you very much. I'm very happy you came. And you made me one of the tricots. <laughs> because they said my traditional regalia is a tricot. You came and made me dressed in one of the tricots. I don't know how far our traditional outfit will be called a tricot. But I believe that with time, people will be educated to know the difference between a tricot 
and a traditional outfit. All right, it was a pleasure having you. It was equally a pleasure being with you in today's edition of the program, The Inside on Equinox Television, signing out from the parliamentary flat in the nation's capital, the Aonde. My name is Francis Chandi and Emmanuel Job. Good night. <laughs>